Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, AI Analytics and Automation with Nick White. Today, Nick will discuss AI for good. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A panel. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To open the chat and the Q&A panels, you will find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and the recording of the session and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you the speaker for the monthly series, Nick White. Nick is a seasoned professional with over two decades of ex expertise and is dedicated to driving impactful business outcomes through the strategic application of data analytics and AI. His extensive experience spans diverse industries, showcasing a passion for leveraging data's transform transformative potential to fuel innovation, optimize decision making, and streamlining operations. Nick is recognized for his adaptness in assisting organizations across various industry verticals, consistently achieving positive business results through data-driven strategies. And with that, let me give the floor to Nick to begin his presentation. Hello and welcome. Hey, thanks, Shannon. Hey, everybody. Um, God, it's nice to hear nice things about myself. I should do that myself instead of having to do this to hear it. Um, I'm really excited. This is our last episode of the season, um, but not our last episode ever. Um, I'm going to get a little cheeky with it, as the Brits say here. And, um, you know, follow this agenda, which is a cold open, which is just me talking right now. Um, there's the good and the bad. So we have to frame AI in the right perspective, both the good and the bad. Then we have to talk about the ugly, which is generally, OK, what do I do to get to the good that nobody wants to do? And all of us who are data professionals are well aware of how hard it is to get somebody to actually define a data element. Um, and then we'll do Q&A. You can see I'll be active in the chat. Um, I've kind of got my control center here. I like seeing everybody. Okay, Victor, then you got the cheeky part. I'm glad. Um, and then we'll do a QA. and a If you have any formal Q&A, that's great. If not, you know, definitely talk amongst yourselves, talk in the chat. Um, I'm looking at it because I have ADD and that's what I do. Um, so let's start with the cold open. Um, obviously, the more interaction I get, the better. Um, and a lot of bad dad jokes or data jokes. That was the first one that you're going to hear today, but uh, I don't take myself too seriously. Um, I generally try to talk to three types of user personas. The first are data professionals, which I assume most of us are, and I identify as a business owner, which I, I am one of those too, and then a leader. Um, and I think we can all identify as all of these if we want to, because there's a lot we have to do to get, you know, what is a seemingly very easy thing over the line. Um, like I said, last one of this year, it's been great working with Shannon and team, and I'm excited um, at the future. If you want to, you can go back and listen to some of, you know, the episodes leading up to this. Um, you know, quite frankly, as I was going through putting this together, you know, to bring it all together, I was going through a bunch of this. And I also went through some of the stuff I've done uh, with Shannon and Dataversity before around, you know, their enterprise data governance, uh, digital events and things of that nature. So definitely check those out if you want to hear more terrible Midwestern accents. So announcements, we are renewed for the next season. Um, so I'm excited to say that we'll be doing another 10 episodes next year. So um, if you like that, I hopefully you come back. Um, and then I've also taken a different role and I'm excited about it. So uh, I saw somebody was from Chicago. I, I lived there for, you know, five years, met my wife, still go there all the time. But I've actually joined Ashley Partners, which um, they are a hyper automation consultancy. And I'm going to help them, you know, get better with their their data analytics and AI to really turn that into uh, much more intelligent automation. So I'm really excited about both those things. And I have to tell you that because, hey, it impacts if you come back or not. Um, I just want to ground us. If you've seen me before, I'm not going to milk this, but I do believe that decision intelligence is the thing that we need to focus on whenever we start talking about AI and data and analytics and automation, because at the end of the day, 
you know, data really is trying to drive better outcomes, you know, through, you know, suggesting and informing better decisions that give us better processes. And we're a huge part of that, whether we are, you know, a data engineer doing ETL or a data strategist trying to, you know, get folks to define data and, you know, or we might be an analytics or data scientist trying to create some of the solutions. So, um, I always want to just focus on that and just focus on the fact that, you know, we are, yes, it says step four, but we are definitely a part of the circle of life or a virtuous circle where decisions are made, processes try to, you know, drive, you know, in, enforce those decisions, outcomes happen, and we have data throughout all of this. And hopefully, if we're able to drive people the correct way, you know, they're definitely being, you know, data driven and not just data rich, you know, anybody can have a lot of data and dashboards, you know, this is how we fit into it, right? You know, actually applying analytics and AI, and you'll see I always embed AI and analytics, because although it is great to market around AI, you know, it is a part of analytics, it's the part of analytics that says, I don't know the rules to analyze this and find patterns, help me find it, computer. Um, and that's that's important to distinguish. And then you have data mining and analytics, which you know is the building of it, and then the data management side of it, which is so important. Um, just bringing us back to AI is everywhere. Um, it's not just the foundation models we hear so much about. It's not just you know ChatGPT or AI applications. You know, there's all these things in between. And then there's the good old AI platforms. So let's let's take data bricks and let's start training models, right? So we have to consider this entire landscape when we start to think about um, how we're going to use it for good. All right, speaking of good, we cannot deny the really good things about AI, why it's so, you know, why there's so much hype. And I know a lot of data professionals like myself you kind of want to roll your eyes. Um, I do think that, um, you know, these large models that are available are game changers and uh, it's not going away. Um, <laughs> I've been at this new job for, you know, almost three weeks, not even. And I can't tell you how much we're talking about the same type of things. Now, I think it's up to us uh, to frame that in in ways that is more productive and that we know will deliver value um, and I just threw out like AI for productivity. I would love to know in the chat if you're using AI today somehow. Um, I use it every day. Um, I use it in both my personal and professional life. It's it's just been, you know, I hate to call it a therapist, but, you know, there there's a lot that it can do. Oh, man, that's awesome, Don. I think that's such an underutilized thing. Like, how hard is it to go and actually get... Um, to get some, you know, information and profiling around data, how hard it is to get, again, data definition, super hard. Um, so yeah, definitely let me know if you're using it, what you're using it for, because if you're not using it, I would really encourage you to, because, you know, productivity, if we just think about, you know, basic, hey, how do I answer questions faster? How do I find answers faster? Knowledge type of stuff. Wow you know, 14%, 40% for, you know, highly skilled non-technical workers. So I just think about some of the stuff I do on a daily basis, creating this, um, I don't even know what to call these anymore. It's a presentation, used to call it a PowerPoint. I want to call it a deck. I don't know anymore. But at the end of the day, creating content and doing things where you're kind of an expert and it, 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 it attaches to you. Um, is super important. And then even if you're more technical, I mean, so many productivity gains. Yeah, it doesn't work like magic. It never was. But, you know, when you're smart enough and you're open-minded and experiment, you can really get some tremendous, tremendous gains. Um, and I love that you guys are using it for a bunch of different stuff. That's, that's great to see. I was hoping... <laughs> This group would be because we we can be the ones that take away the hype and show how it's great. It is transformative. I mean, have you guys seen as much of a 
boom of AI companies since like the dot com boom. I mean, it's insane and it's not going to slow down. And again, I'm not cele celebrating this as something that, you know, oh, we can take advantage of. But I'm more saying, hey, once again, you know, there's a lot of hype and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of gains and there are economic macroeconomic impacts that are going to happen. And if we think about AI for good, how do we make sure that this is having a positive impact, both commercially and sociologically, right? Um, I think those aren't, you know, mutually exclusive to each other. So this is, you know, this is really some of the great stuff that we're seeing, right? And here's another question for you, and I'm glad to see you all are using it, but you know, let me know what type of organization you think you're in. You know, if we just think about, you know, 5% are leading edge, we're doing crazy stuff, you know, R&D around this, um, investing heavily, you know, this is happening, you know, it's probably 5% of the folks that are in organizations that are using it. Proactive, you know, that's about a third. I actually think that's the sweet spot. So about 33% of companies and organizations when, you know, taking on a new uh, a new investment or a new type of technology, you know, they're being proactive about it, but they're not trying to like be a leader, you know? Um, and then reactive, I mean, hey, I guess, I guess I'll let everybody use Copilot. Uh, Robin, I'm glad you have, you're allowed to use it, but man, you wouldn't be, you'd be so surprised how you know, afraid everybody is of it. And, you know, definitely let me know which one of these you are, talk amongst yourself. I mean, you know, there's a lot to be said for, you know, folks like us getting together and just sharing what we're seeing. Um, but these are real things and I've seen each one of them. And it's, it's very interesting. Um, and that's why I love being more of a consultant than I do um, being in a product company. Um, let's reframe what it means, you know, and the bottom line, right, is, you know, and everybody is going to look at that right side and say, yeah, you know, AI is going to be used to get leaner. Um, you know, that is one way to put it, the way that I'm framing it, and I will continue to frame it, and I talk about a little bit later, is just this idea of, instead of cost savings, can we talk about capacity savings, so that we can use, you know, industry knowledge, organizational knowledge, um, human creativity to solve things we're not getting to, to actually grow faster or increase revenues. So at the end of the day, and this is value realization for every organization, for everything they do, not just AI, but I think it's important, you know, that we always ground this, you know, where we get lost a lot of times is, you know, some of the bad that's coming up, which is when we're not thinking about where's the value. Um, I mean, I've I've showed a version of this slide a million times. <laughs> and I mean, I can't get away from it. I can't get away from the fact that even though AI is tremendous and so exciting, and like I said, 60% of people will be using it in some way. I, I hope we're a little bit above that here today. Um, and there's all this investment, like at the end of the day, and I was literally just talking to somebody on my new team, but it fails to deliver. And like, it, it's still down to the same things that probably most of us on here have been talking about for a while or that we've found and we've realized, which is that, you know, you know the first one is, hey, like, when high performing companies are using this, um, it's really hard because it's not really integrated into how people work, their processes, their mindset. I mean, AI is really just about how do I take examples and, you know, give you predictions of a pattern. Um, and when we think about that and we think about where it gets lost, you know, I have so many you know, I always talk about some of my times just trying to take, you know, this beautiful demand forecast and just giving somebody 
one data point to make a better decision on when it comes down to it. How are we integrating it into the experience that the person intended to use the data or AI is actually using it? And are we being mindful? And 30, 36% are kind of doing it, but I mean, it's not, we all know that it's not right. <laughs> we all know there's a lot of sunken costs. And I know this, you know, we are a DAMA rich um, group here. And we can't talk about the fact that bad data and, you know, whether it's misunderstood or of poor quality, at the end of the day, I don't really care. It gets in the way of anything. Um, and then literacy and talent, you know, you just think about, hey, we hired a consultant like Nick. He built this awesome thing. I don't know what to do with it. Um, I don't know how to use it. I don't know how to maintain it. I don't know how to iterate on it. So, you know, think of literacy and talent, not only from a user end user perspective, but also, you know, what does an organization have to, you know, build and scale and it, it gets lost. It really does. And, you know, look, nothing new here. And <laughs> hopefully uh, the smooth sounds of my voice um, are a little bit more entertaining, but we've all heard this before, right? And it's just like rule-based data and analytics. And for those of you who don't know what I mean by that, that's all just the stuff that we used to do before, you know, machine learning and AI became so popular and also so available to be used. But, you know, it, it's just more ampl amplified because we're letting a computer run and do something, right? So, you know, bias is the biggest one. We all have bias. Um, we create AI. We train AI. We feed AI prompts. And at the end of the day, we have to be very careful about the bias, you know, and if we're not, we're not balancing that, then it becomes, you know, very hard. You know, I, I listened to podcasts this morning and they were just talking about a little bit about AI and just this idea of if these large language models um, and foundation models are trained on the internet, um, you know, do we think, <laughs> and I'll ask this group and then I'll give, uh, I'll give an answer at the end of this. Do we think most of it is cynical content that it's ingesting from the internet or do we think it's positive, you know, and you guys, Decide on your own. Uh, let me know which one you think it is. <laughs> yeah, you think? It's just, we have to know this stuff. Um, you know, again, there's going to be folks that are, yes, Joshua, it's actually the Huberman Lab podcast. And there there's an episode just around um, becoming, <laughs> you'd be surprised, um, but becoming less cynical and what that means. Um, so it was, it was very interesting that they started to talk about AI in that context. Um, but that's, it's a bias. It's a bias towards negativity. Um, there's also all sorts of social in inequality. Um, there's also just the bias of what was is. So even if you think about it in a business context, you know, you don't innovate from what was, you innovate from what could be, um, which is the complete opposite of being cynical and more of having a growth mindset. Um, Fraud, of course, we can use this thing to, man, I just, I met my wife online. Yep. Uh, but it wasn't an app and there was no swiping, no no judgment on that. It was old timey. Uh, but at the same time, I'm sure I was catfished. I mean, I love that show. I watch it and I, I'm sure I was talking to folks that <laughs> were not themselves. I mean, this is, you see the deep fakes, you see it. Um, breaches, I mean, the amount of data I just, I just saw, um, <laughs> again, on my AI generated algorithm for Instagram, um, I'm a golfer and they just said, oh, there was some sort of PGA tour data breach. Um, yeah, I mean, these things are using information. It's, it, things are going to get out. It's, it's so hard. Um, and Jeremiah, I completely agree. <laughs> I don't even know what to do anymore. Uh, let's not forget just the um, ecological impacts. Um, you know, these server farms that are doing things, it's crazy. They are consuming so much energy. And yeah, you know, 
uh, folks like OpenAI will always equate it to um, how much they invest to create some things that we use. Um, you know, I think we all know here <laughs> that when people go out to build something, you know, they can take shortcuts. So, you know, in my mind that they do the best in organizing their data. No, they didn't. Um, and then of course, hallucinations, like um, if we put that in, in terms of making better decisions, relying only on AI to give you intelligence would just, that's not super intelligent. We need, we need some checks and balances there. Um, you know, yes, you know, we can come at that from a personal perspective, you know, but if you, you know, don't quite, if you don't jump in and try to use AI, if you don't, um, <laughs> if you're not kind of pragmatic about it, um, and, and make some errors, right? You're going to lose ground to competitors. You're going to waste a ton of money, a ton of money. Um, I can't even tell you how much money gets wasted. And then of course, the old adage of broken trust, whether it's, you know, your external customers or your internal customers, um, this is the bad side of it. It's, it's both, you know, it brings up ethical quandaries that also have you know, commercial impacts. And I say both of those because I think that it's important to uh, always connect it to what a general organization, whether it's for profit or not for profit, at the end of the day, they're trying to figure out how, to, how do you make money. Um, so I just, I throw this in here because if you guys take it and uh, can use it in any of your um, presentations, on the inside of your organizations. I'm happy about that. All right. Um, yeah, yeah, there's, uh, I, I'm just taking a look at the the time in the chat, but yeah, what I would tell you is that um, this is a tool, <laughs> it's a tool. Like what is technology? Um, you know, if you go back to uh, Space Odyssey, you know, um, you kind of know, oh, hey, I can use this stick to hit you, or I can use a wheel to move things around, right? Like, just because <laughs> it's not as uh, what we would consider um, kind of basic, <laughs> as the kids say, it's still a tool. And you're 100% right, Jeremiah. Um, you know, it, it's not so much, and I, I'm a big believer too, that um, inventions aren't out of thin air. Um, everything is kind of based on uh, something that came before it and unique ways that you put that together and the orchestration. And quite frankly, um, I think this year, most organizations have asked for one to one million chatbots. And what they find very quickly is that I can't just you know, use a natural language processing um, model like GPT-4 or whatever you want to take and just point it at my <laughs> documentation and off we go. It's just not like that. Um, and I think we all know this and, and we just got to, you know, tell the story. Uh, we know definitely the data side, right? But we also have to think about, hey, you know, if I want to use a chatbot or a natural language interface, because that's a way easier way to talk to a computer rather than what we do today, then what's the orchestration behind the scenes? If I'm asking something that's actually exists in tabular data, maybe I look use a common lookup because, um, and that's just basic, you know, data stuff, right? Um, so definitely you know, using natural language to create a better experience is terrific. Um, providing, you know, recommendations and personalization is terrific. Um, but at the end of the day, it has to be a part of a bigger tool set. Um, and Maria, yeah, like, you know, having, having questions, prompt engineering, prompt tuning, whatever we want to call it, they, there's a lot of techniques. Um, and there's really emerging 
positions. I mean, prompt en engineering was very hot topic, <laughs> um, you know, a year ago, maybe two years ago. You know, I think it's, you know, we're kind of looking at, you know, folks that are more like AI developers. It's almost, it's almost like a full stack custom application developer that you know, can do prompt tuning and do some vectorizing, you know, there, there's so much there that we can take from, you know, custom app dev that's super, you know, impactful. Um, you know, you're right, uh, Bob, rule-based tools do not create hallucinations, um, but whoever wrote the rules has a bias. Um, so, and they have knowledge. So it's, you know, it's very, it can get a little bit out of the, you know, scope of things, but also I think um, rule-based tools can definitely um, create a limit to what we're able to do, which, you know, that's, that's what we're looking at is how do I go from knowing what the rules are to trying to identify the rules through, you know, AI and machine learning. But that, that's a great point. Um, I would just argue that there's biases in both. All right, speaking of the ugly, um, Shannon, I brought it back, your favorite side of all time. Um, but this is this remains to be everything everybody's talking about. Um, and, you know, when I think about how do you do AI for good, it's about doing the right things right, <laughs> very simply. Um, and everybody knows the right way to do things, um, but it takes more time. Um, it's more iterative and it's not as beautiful, um, you know, and gosh, I'm trying to think if my daughter has done this move lately, but this was my jam back in the day is ah, how few steps can I, I actually take. Um, but anyway, I had to bring it back because I, I can't get away from it. Um, you know, firstly, you have to bring an innovation mindset, a growth mindset, whatever we want to call it, um, because, you know, you're not going to nail it right away. It's new. It, there's a lot of black box that you don't understand. Um, you're going to fail, but you can fail small and you can adjust, um, you know, and the first thing that comes with an innovation mindset is not creating some sort of chain of orders and deliveries, you know, like this is not McDonald's. Um, we need a cross-functional team, uh, which includes, you know, and I, I like to put, there's business folks, there's data, data and analytics folks, and then there's more traditional engineering folks. All of those need to be in there. Um, and you can't get away with it. And that's where I've seen a lot of success and where I haven't seen success is when, you know, it becomes a technology group foisting, um, some sort of AI thing on a business unit or a business unit going and doing things, um, outside of the scope of what they're supposed to just because they can't get the support they want. You know, and, you know, a lot of times us data and analytics folks kind of go, oh, you know, I don't know about that. Like, I think we all have to work together. So that that's the first thing. Um, continuous learning. I just, the, yes, like everything fails. Everybody makes mistakes. You know, Michael Jordan only made 40% of his shots. Like these are things he's still, the. you know, I won't get into that argument of who's the greatest, but you know, the best, the best of the best in anything fail a lot, but they learn a lot um, and they adjust and they evolve and improve. And without that idea that the knowledge, knowledge is a valuable thing to have, even if it's from a failure, we have to get that mindset shifted. And then I always come back, you know, because I feel like, you know, a lot of times we can go into our capabilities or our business units and kind of take our ball and go home, right? Um, what I like about design thinking is just the idea of at the end of the day, you know, this cross-functional team who is trying to learn as we go, 
um, they are, you're really trying to design something, design a service um, that will have a lot of things that are going to be in the backstage or that won't be client facing or the front stage and will be client facing. And they have to work together and it's best to do them at the same time. So think about, you know, and if you're not familiar with design thinking, think about the front stage, like literally of a stage theater. And that's where the, sh that's where the show happens, but the backstage so much happens, you know, and how do we, how do we set up the backstage to support what, you know, the customers are seeing or the people who are going to use are seeing. So in my mind, having that, idea of hey you know we need to improve the backstage to improve the front stage and vice versa you know and how do we make composable parts that we can reuse and how do we how do we learn from what we've built over here and you know make it reusable over here these are all super important um and and why because they kind of hedge you know the investments that are happening so you know, if we're not over promising and under delivering and we're hedging the idea that we need the solution when we don't even know, you know, maybe what the problem is, design thinking helps you get through that. Um, so, yeah. Anyway. Um, and at the end of the day, this is kind of the way I see um, how things work, right? You have your data management side, we're all well aware of that, right? You know, data platforms, governance quality, you know, ETL, like all of that good stuff. Um, then you have your data mining and analytics, you know, one of the things that, you know, you have your rule-based analytics, you have your model creation, and then you have your model use case tuning, less of the model creation these days, more of the model use case tuning, whether that's, you know, prompt tuning or fine tuning. Um, but think about how we're applying that. We're either trying to help someone make a better decision and optimize their decisions through intelligence, however we get it. We're trying to automate something, right? So we're trying to make something a little bit easier to do, a little bit less repetitive, because if we give the right data to answer the question that drives the decision, we're going to be able to, you know, make it a lot easier, more accurate, faster. Um, and then, of course, just the idea of recommendations, personalization. So, you know, forecasting, you know, all, all of the stuff that, you know, traditional data science has gone against. But at the end of the day, we have to be applying this stuff towards an end. <laughs> and it can't just be because we want it. Um, so really trying to frame everything AI does around where the value lies. Um, I'm a data strategy guy. That's not an accident. <laughs> I do think you start with the strategy, but I don't necessarily see strategy as having, oh, we're going to do a strategy for two weeks and then go. I do think strategy needs to persist throughout um, a product's life cycle. Um, because that really connects it to the outcomes that we're trying to drive towards. Um, and what does a strategy um, in case? So I'm a big believer in agile development. I'm a big believer in building the plane while flying it. And you know the best way to do that is to understand and prioritize the use cases. And you know, quite frankly, that's a start. <laughs> um, but that at least gives you something where you you know where the pain points are. You know, hey, if we can do something in this space, you know, how how do we help it? You know, the second is that analysis of the use case. Again, so many use cases have repeatable patterns. Um, so many AI use cases necessarily aren't ready for AI. The data is not ready. The users and organization isn't ready. Um, and quite frankly, if we think about a maturity curve in this space, you know, I want to go from not using data to using data. So I better have done that if I want AI. And then I want to go from using data to 
starting to kind of stretch the capacity of, um, you know, what we can do. So maybe I do get involved and I use a little bit of machine learning or maybe, hey, just give me a self-service so that I can poke around more. I think it's super important that we're pragmatic about that and that we look at a bigger picture to make sure that we don't um, sink costs. And it's becoming more and more difficult um, to do this analysis because it seems like all the cost centers and all the folks that are paying for this stuff, they're just, they're running a hundred miles an hour and uh, it's really hard to get them to kind of come together and, and be very smart about it. And then there's of course, um, the whole idea of which service, which level service makes sense. Am I buying and I'm building from scratch <laughs> a little bit of both? Like, what are we doing? Um, you have to be pragmatic about that. And, and part of that too, is just looking at the expertise. Um, you may decide, yep, AI seems like the solution, but like, are people ready to use it? Do I have the right folks to do it? These are all important um, and you can fill gaps, but you also have to have, once you fill those gaps, you have to have an idea of where you're going next. Um, again, a roadmap like, Let's start, let's stop treating things like projects and let's start treating them like products. I, I just, I'm a big believer in that. Um, so whether it's, you know, features on a user interface, prompt tuning, you know, improving the grounding data, adding new integrations, growing data maturity, you know, how, how does this going to start off by adding value that's worth, you know, the investment and then where do you go from there? Because that's that's where you're really successful. And without a roadmap, you know, if you're trying to do waterfall in this space, you're just, you're toast. Um, it's just never going to be able to deliver what you want. Um, and then, like I said before, I, I believe that everybody has a role in building AI and analytics solutions. And oftentimes, People are left out. People work outside of their roles or their expertise. So, you know, business people might want to tell technology or data people the data they need or the solution they need. That's not really their role in this space. Their role in this space is to say, you know, I have to make this decision. I need data. Um, or I want to automate this decision, you know, with AI or, you know, automation. And this is... This is kind of the factors that come into it. So there's a huge role there, but the role is not to say what data you need and the role is not to say what solution you need. And on the flip side, I often see, you know, data folks get involved and maybe start to speak on behalf of the business. That's also not so good. Um, and that, that rings true for technology. So making sure true collaboration happens means everybody has a seat at the table, and can you know focus on the part that they need to um, be the expert in? And, and to me, that's a strategy. A strategy is not a half a million dollar deck <laughs> based on surveys and interviews. It really has to be actionable, and you have to see it through. Um, and that that's why I kind of you know transitioned from data science to to governance all the way into overarching strategy. Um, and this, this is kind of what I was talking about before. You can see on the bottom, we have your basic medallion architecture um, and what is needed in each one. Like, yeah, you can, you can do some advanced analytics or ML on silver level data, that's okay. Um, but like, I wouldn't do self-service on that because it's really easy to make some bad decisions, just like I wouldn't automate on silver, I would want to make sure that it's of gold level. Um, and you know, when I talk about iterative and pragmatic, like this is the way that you know, one proof of value. Can we do we know that if we can find some data, it could help? Number one, you can do that on whatever. You know, that's like data mining. And, you know, that could even there's plenty there. And then just ad hoc of having a team support or somebody support all the way into data science and 
and self-service analytics with some of, you know, you can go back and listen to um, augmented analytics, but like self-service analytics, a lot of this, it's, you know, the time, the time to value is, is shorter and shorter, but it's still important that, you know, we're bringing everybody along on the journey and, you know, high tide raises all boats and you have to make sure you're doing that. This is the way I've seen it work at a lot of Fortune 500 companies I've worked with. And then I've also seen it fail when, you know, we're not quite taking a pragmatic and iterative approach. Um, and finally, being vigilant. Um, I don't know how else to put it, but documentation. <laughs> documentation is so important. Um, versioning is so important. Like, just be smart about it. Um, you know, I've argued with agile purists um, my entire career that, you know, it says minimum amount of documentation. It doesn't say no documentation. <laughs> um, that just becomes a mess. And that's part of being vigilant is making sure that all of this is, you know, um, written down and can be understood by folks. Controls, 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 you know, you have to have them. Um, and again, that comes down to documentation. If I define the data, if I define the models, if I define the analysis, at the end of the day, it'll be a lot easier, you know, to know who should have access to it and what data to use to test and what data to use to train and making sure it's not the same, right? Like, you know, a lot of a lot of things that happen in, in AI development is just they basically train the model and test the model on the training data. And I mean, that's really like writing the test and taking it yourself. Now, at my age, I forget stuff, which, you know, whatever. So I might not get 100%, but, you know, I, I am pretty, I, I am more apt to pass a test I've written um, than anything. And you just got to not only test it, but continually validate it and monitor it and set up alerts. Um, you know, every organization, whether it's for show or not, they have things they talk about ethically that they're, they're very, very, um, bullish on, whether it's, you know, being green, CO2 neutral, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, great. Let's, let's use that to make sure, um, our AI models and, you know, applications are, are definitely fair and they're not you know, amplifying bad things out there because um, you don't want that. And then the la last but not least is just, and you guys know about lineage, I'm sure. I mean, the worst thing is that, right? And hallucinations are kind of like, well, where did that come from? Well, you know, we, we trained, <laughs> we trained this LLM to, again, not reason, but predict the next word that they should say when you ask it a question. Um, and we have no idea where this stuff comes from, you know, and we, you know, we know internet this and documentation that, but understanding where everything's coming from, where everything's going, what's happening in between, and just make it very transparent. And, you know, there's a phrase that I'm going to steal from, you know, a woman who's much smarter than me. Um, but let's treat data with a lowercase d and not a capital D, which means it's just data. It was data. If we go back to my original slide, it was data. It was created, you know, through processes that people were a part of usually. Um and at the end of the day, uh, you know, we have to be able to say, yes, this is data. This is another piece of information, but it's not the end all be all. So um, I know as somebody who's been driving people to go away from their gut data and use more organizational data, it's kind of it's a new concept for me to wrap my arms around. But at the same time, I know it's true. And I know it's true just because, you know, the last five years of my life, 
you know, maybe 10, <laughs> no, probably, yeah, almost 10, last 10 years of my life, I've been trying to get people to improve their data quality, but it's still data. You know, at the end of the day, we can do, whoops, we can do whatever we want, but, um, and that's not me checking in on myself, by the way, um, even though I should. But at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we are being um, completely transparent about where things come from and what's happening. And then again, let's let's let humans do the actual reasoning because no, no system is. They're following rules we have or they're trying to make rules based on data we've given it. Um, you know, and yeah, Bob, I couldn't agree more. Um, they are just predicting. It's a prediction engine. LLMs are predicting words and tokens. That's what they do. And it sounds like <laughs> they're really smart. I, I like said, I've told this, and I think you know some of my colleagues that I've worked at with at Microsoft have stolen this, but it is young Sheldon. It is a genius six-year-old. And it's going to be able to figure out what to say given you saying something to it. I mean, that's what it is. It's a prediction engine. It's not a reasoning engine. The reasoning comes when humans start to tie things together and maybe take advantage of different prediction engines and make it actually work and, and tie it together. So be vigilant. Um, time for formal Q and A. If you guys have cues, I'll try to give A's. Nick, thank you so much for another great presentation. I was so excited that you used the slide, my favorite slide today. Uh, especially that I got to produce today <laughs> and to see it. Uh, and there are questions. If you have questions for Nick, feel free to put them in the Q and A panel, and I will get to as many as I can here in the time we have left. So. Uh, Nick, uh, regarding the Forrester report uh, that you mentioned earlier, I agree that data quality is an issue, but unstructured data should be a sweet spot for AI, shouldn't it? I mean, yeah, but I think what we're seeing in general is that um, we have to start treating content and unstructured data the same way that we've been treating structured data. I mean, it needs to be that's why vector databases are hot. We need to tag it. Like there's still, even though it's better at that, it still needs to have an understanding and orchestration around, well, what does this actually mean? And I think that's where things like prompt tuning and even fine tuning come in. So everybody wants to bring a bazooka to a knife fight sometimes and use GPT-4 for everything. But maybe you take a smaller model and maybe you just take more time fine tuning and then training it. Um, you know, content is still data and <laughs> there's still there's still a, le a level of, you know, semi structuring that has to happen to it. Um, so I would think about, you know, the best the best um, content for an LLM to interact with is actually semi-structured, not unstructured. So think tags and, you know, that's why it's almost feature engineering for content, if that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. So regarding e uh, ecological uh, impacts, what do you think of big tech investment in nuclear? I mean, I don't know. It's been a while since I've watched Chernobyl, the TV series. But, um, you know, in general, yeah, that I mean, that's fine if it's safe. You know, I would I would also argue that. You know, and hopefully this plays well with <laughs> my people in here, this crowd, but, you know, we all know that if we manage and process data um, up upstream, it takes a lot less compute power to do what we need. Um, so yeah, that's fine. But I also think, you know, I don't know if you guys remember, but 
chat GPT came out, people were gaga over it. Oh, this is like the next thing. And then maybe six months later, you find out that, oh yeah, they were just using offshoring low cost resources to tag a bunch of stuff. I mean, it still comes down to, you know, you need human intelligence and context to actually add any value. Um, so yeah, I mean, they're trying to find shortcuts and a shortcut to spending more money is to go <laughs> stand up a nuclear power plant. It's, it's wild. It's a wild world we live in. It really is. <laughs> So, uh, Nick, uh, to leverage AI and LLMs while also ensuring the security of your proprietary data, is building an internal tool the preferred option, or can appropriate security be achieved through third-party AI tools? And in addition, should an LLM be built around and trained with your internal data to ensure accurate and appropriate responses to your company's industry and focus areas? Yeah, that's, it's a good question. It's the $20,000 question. Um, at the end of the day, <laughs> they are saying that it is not trained on our data and they are being the big cloud providers, right? And we'll throw open AI in there. So, you know, technically, um, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, open AI, blah, 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 right? Um, they are not training on your data. You know, uh, Microsoft has ways to, you know, mask it. Um, and if you have an issue with it, there's more self-reporting of, hey, this didn't quite do what I thought, you know, so that's there. You know, a separate question is, you know, and I tend to believe that the most value gains will happen when taking a smaller yet capable, um, so a small large language model, you know, something like Phi 3 or something that's, you know, good enough to understand. But, you know, if you think about, and I always have thought about buy versus build, um, hey, buy if it's just table stakes, right? Like there's no competitive advantage build if there's something to be gained there. So when you think about using something like a large language model or a small language model or whatever we want to call, you know, I think the use cases that would require more fine tuning and, you know, more specific to the domain and the company itself, like, and by domain, I mean, industry, you know, like, the more domain specific these things are, the better, which means I would probably use a smaller language model and create a bespoke version of that. Now, I what I would warn against is I don't think there's any reason that you need to build your own AI from scratch. I would just ra I would just rather downgrade, you know, to a smaller version and then train like crazy on domain and organizational knowledge. You know, um, unless it's pretty straightforward, then you just kind of use a RAG architecture, um, which would just be, you know, doing some prompt engineering and then um, vectorizing some content and then kind of going from there. That's actually, you know, where I would start in general because that can do most use cases people have. But the the highest value ones are going to be the ones that you're going to need to use a smaller one and and train it more intensively. Indeed, now there's as well as in the Q and A, but there's a lot of questions that came into the uh, chat there as you were going, Nick. Um, by the way, can you share the podcast name that you mentioned? I'm sorry. Oh, can you reshare the podcast name? Or share the podcast name that you mentioned? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was the Huberman Lab, um, which is, it's one I go back to and listen to. Um, and it was specifically the September 2nd um, episode 
about, uh, and it's really about, and I know this says a lot about me as a person, but how to cultivate a positive growth oriented mindset. And towards the end, they really get into AI. So it's, it's really interesting to kind of hear, you know, it's a very scientific approach to life, I would say. So Huberman Lab, September 2nd. Perfect. Thank you. And a couple more questions that came into the chat. Um, uh, do you have any successful business AI experience examples, um, like where AI made money or saved money, uh, barring operational efficiency? Yeah, I mean, so I always go back to so open AI. I forget one, I, I forget the timing. It feels like it's been 10 years, but six months at the same time. They they release GPT and they had been working on it. How do we think <laughs> that Google and Facebook and Amazon said, hey, we have one. And they said, we have one really quickly, right? So, I mean, if you just think about Google, you know, as in Googling things, like that is, they are using machine learning, AI to create better search experiences, to create more personalization, you know, to create more understanding around patterns about people, to sell ads dynamically. And then, I mean, you think about Llama and you think about Facebook, and obviously those are huge successes. Um, and, you know, those are the two that come to my mind. I think there's a lot of heat on Tesla and there's a lot of heat because of who the, the CEO is. But I think what they've done um, in the automotive industry is also just a huge, a huge boon. And, um, you know, finally, um, if you ever go to Starbucks and you have their app, you know, man, what a convergence of business strategy and AI and machine learning. Um, the evolution from very generalized offers and star system and gamification to what they have now is just, it's really crazy. Um, so those are ones that come to mind when I think about it. They've always been right there. Um, and even some of the stuff the Salesforce platform does. It's AI driven, you know, it's, it's really been there the whole time. I see. Um, yeah, we've got about less, sorry, uh, less than three minutes here. We had another question that came in. So Nick, do you think there is a significant effort towards more uh, explainable AI? And how do you think we can improve AI explainability? Um, I mean, I think it goes back to the, <laughs> the vigilant slide I have. I know it was very dramatic, but I'm very dramatic. Um, at the end of the day, documentation um, and being upfront about, you know, what the data is going into it, how it's being told to reason through things. Um, those are very important. And um, I think it seems anti-capitalistic to <laughs> tell people that stuff. Um, but again, I think one of our, our smart listeners here had just said, hey, I, AI is a tool. Like, okay, then it's just a tool. The secret sauce is not in, you know, the data you used and the way you're telling it to do things, right? Um, I think it needs to be more upfront. Um, I think we could all be a little more discerning um, around it as well. But, you know, in my mind, it comes down to documentation um, and just kind of putting down, <laughs> make as much money at all costs. You know, the profit motive is great and terrible at the same time. So, you know, but I, I think once organizations, organizations realize um, 
AI is not the actual solution, but it's a tool in, in the solution, in the service set. Remember service design? Once, once folks realize that, um, I think they'll realize that they can provide enough documentation and explainability without giving away any secret sauce. I love it. Well, Nick, thank you so much. That's perfect timing because that brings us right to the top of the hour. Okay, that is all the time we have for this webinar. Thanks to all of our attendees who have uh, who have hung out with us today and attended. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar. We're playing some slides and that's the recording. Nick, thanks so much. Thanks all. Thanks everybody.